Well, as I've already mentioned this evening, we're returning to Psalm 119, and we're going to be looking at verses 105 through 112. So I will read that for you as uh, we begin. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 105. The psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O oh, accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this evening. Now again, last time we considered uh, why it is that you and I should love God's law even as the psalmist loved the law. And again, we, we asked that question last time, and actually it's, it's shot throughout this entire psalm. Why did he love it? Well, was it because, as many churches seem to believe today, though we do not believe that, as at least in this particular church, and there are other churches that would agree with us, that he was keeping it because somehow he was under a covenant of works that he had to earn his way to salvation. He saw himself incrementally working his way closer and closer. Now, that's not the reason why he loved it. He understood his sin. He understood that he couldn't uh, obey the, the law well enough in order to save himself. He understood that he came into the world already guilty. No, he was keeping the law of God because it is good, because uh, he, he loved it because it was good, because it showed him uh, how God wanted to be loved. And he loved God and wanted to show God love. So he was thankful that God showed him how he could do that. Uh, he loved it because it showed him how he could love his neighbor and honor him as the Lord would have him to because he loved the Lord and wanted to honor God in that as well. It showed him how he could do what he did uh, for God's glory in a way that would honor him. And again, because he loved him, that's what he wanted to do. And it showed him also how he could take the things that he actually has in this world and actually keep them forever, take them out of this world and have them to enjoy. Remember, there are certain things in this world that we have to give up when we come to the end of our lives. We can't take it with you. You know, you've heard the expression, you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it uh, because, you know, it's not going to do you any good. Somebody else is going to have what you have when you die, but whatever you give to the Lord of what you have in this life, whether it be your time, your talents, your gifts, your resources, whatever it is, those are the things that you get to keep because the Lord's going to reward you for those things in the final day. So the psalmist understood that, and he loved God's Word. He loved His law because it showed him how he could do that. That's why Paul kept it, as we've seen, and why our Lord Jesus Christ kept it. And it's also the reason why God has actually given you His Spirit to write the, 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 put the law in your minds and to write it on your hearts because He loves you. And He not only wants you to know what is good, but He wants you to do what is good so that you will benefit, so that you will be blessed by it. I mean, God cares about you, and He knows that this is good for you, and that's why He gives it to you. But that's also why you should, as we saw last week as well, as the psalmist, meditate on it so that you can apply it to your life, so that you can keep it, and so that you can also fight against everything that is contrary to it because it is dangerous for you. Now, this evening's theme is a good follow-up on what we saw last week. Um, this evening, through the psalmist, the Lord tells you not only that you should uh, do these things for the reason we've that we've already seen, and, you know, again, constant, well, meditate on it, apply it, and, and keep it. But that you should do this continually, constantly, without intermission. Uh, you should never take a break 
from obedience. Now, I think it's clear from what the psalmist tells us this evening that that is what he wanted to do. That was his purpose. Look at verse 112. He says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Uh, understanding how important these things were for all the reasons already given and for his well-being, the psalmist wanted to keep the commandments continually from now to the end of his life. Now, I do want you to notice that even though the psalmist was a believer, that this was something that he said that he had to actually purpose to do. He had to incline his heart towards keeping God's commandments. And the reason why he had to do that is because he has the same problem or had the same problem, not anymore, but the same problem that we have. We have a tendency not to do what God tells us to do. We have an internal enemy that is constantly fighting against us. Now, this reminds us what Scripture teaches us, that sanctification, becoming more like Jesus Christ, is not something that happens automatically. It's something that we have to cooperate with, something that we have to put work into. Now, we do understand the work of salvation, the work of justification of God saving you from your sins is His work alone. And we understand the Bible teaches that even, uh, well, his, his making us alive is something that He does by Himself. It's not something that we do, but something He does by His Spirit. Jesus says, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. But once we are born again of the Spirit of God, there is a great deal of work that we actually have to do. We have to work along with God to accomplish this work of becoming more like Jesus Christ. It doesn't just go on automatically. And again, I would point you to our meditation this evening. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Does Paul believe or did Paul believe that there was a work that we had to do? He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why the fear? Why the trembling? Well, because if you don't work this out, there are consequences. If God is at work in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, then you should see that being worked out in your life. If you don't see that being worked out in your life, well, then you have every reason to be afraid. Salvation is a cooperative effort. We need to work with God as He's working within us by His Holy Spirit. But now, how much effort do you need to put into it? And, and how often do you need to put this work into it? Is it okay just to do it sometimes and not others? Just sort of, you know, run that sprint and then just sort of, you know, do what you want to do and then kind of work out again and then do what you want to do? No, the Lord tells us that we need to be working at it all the time. As I said before, here's one thing you do not want to take a vacation from because every time you do that, you lose ground. You, you fall back, as it were. You get into trouble. Now, consider the Lord Jesus Christ, whose image that you are you know, predestined to become conformed to. Uh, again, the, the Father is working in you to make you like Him. Did Jesus ever take a break from His obedience? But isn't His example the example that you and I are to follow? If He didn't take a break, are we supposed to take a break? Now, what does the Bible call taking a break from obedience? Sin, that's right. And what happens when you sin? Well, as I've said, you lose ground. You grieve the Holy Spirit. You quench the Holy Spirit. You become more like the world and less like Jesus. In other words, you're going the wrong direction. That's not what you would want to do if your goal is to be like Jesus, and that is what your goal is if the Spirit of God is in you. If that is your goal, you need to do as the psalmist did, what he purposed in his heart that he would do. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. 
Now, that's the, that's the overarching principle, but I want you to notice that he actually does give us several more reasons why we should do this in the several verses of this particular paragraph. Uh, first of all, he says this, you should never take a break from obedience because to do so would be to walk in darkness. Notice he says, the law is a light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is that which shows you the right way to go, the only safe way that you can possibly go. If you're not walking by its light, if you're not actually doing what God's Word tells you to do, then you're walking in darkness. You're walking in ignorance and you're walking in sin. And when you do that, you get into trouble. You know, I used to remember this verse all the time when our family would go camping. You know, it's like you go camping at night, you can't see anything, right? At least if you're doing primitive camping, the campsite, there's no lights around. So if you want to go from point A to point B without tripping, falling, hurting yourself, you need to have a light. You need to have a flashlight so you can see, you know, where the, the pitfalls are, where the rocks are, where the ditches are, where the bushes are, and, and uh, if there's any animals, where the animals are. If you don't have that flashlight, you can get into trouble. Well, the same thing is true of God's law. If you don't have the law of God... Or if you have it and you choose not to walk by it, you basically, it's basically like turning the flashlight off and just groping around in darkness. You're going to trip and you're going to fall. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, because the Bible says so, that's one thing. But consider all the people in this world who live day to day who don't have the law of God. Look at what happens to them. Look at how many get hurt. Look at how many offend others. Look at how many suffer broken relationships, how many suffer broken marriages, how many ruin their lives, how many commit suicide. Now, if they had God's law and they listened to it and they lived by it, they would avoid all of those things, except for the persecution, of course, others would bring on them for doing that. But they would be safe because they would be doing what is right. Now, the point is, you don't have to walk in the darkness that the world is walking in because you have the light, and you can use that light, you need to, and you need to use it. You need to listen to it. You need to do that, not just sometimes, but all the time. I mean, if you're walking along a, a steep cliff in, at nighttime with a flashlight, you don't turn the flashlight off and just hope for the best. How much more, then, should you not turn off God's word while you're walking through such dangerous territory as this world. You want to keep it turned on, which means you want to continue to walk by its light. So why should you continually obey the law of God? Because not to do so is to walk in darkness, and it is dangerous. Now, secondly, he says you should keep it continually because that's what you actually promised God that you would do. Uh, the psalmist says in verse 106, I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. Now, did you swear to keep God's commandments? Well, actually, you did. You did that when by God's grace, you first of all decided to follow Jesus Christ. As we saw this morning, Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, how many of you here this evening call yourselves Christians? Now, to be a Christian means you're following Jesus Christ. Now, he says if you're going to follow me, then you have to pick up your cross and do that. So that is his condition. And if you're not meeting that condition, you're not following him. So if you are following him, that is the condition you need to meet. In other words, you actually promised that you would keep his commandments. Certainly, if you're a member here this evening, that's also what you vowed to do when you became a member of this church. You promised that you would keep the commandments of God. Let me just remind you of that because all of us who are members here have made this promise. And again, whether we had made this or not, we're still bound to it if we are believers. The question four said this, do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your sovereign Lord and do you promise that in reliance on the grace of God, you will serve Him with all that is in you, you will forsake the world, you will resist the devil, 
And you will put to death your sinful deeds and desires and live a godly life. You see, that's what we all promised when we became a part of this church. But whether you had or not, this is still what you are bound to do if you are a believer. That's the reason why we require that, because we want to know whether you're sincere in that commitment. You bound yourself by oath, by vow, to obey the Lord. Not just part of the time. You know, I'll do that part of the time. Yes, you know, okay, when, when it's convenient. But all the time, from now until the time you enter into heaven. Now, that doesn't mean you're always going to succeed because we fail in many different ways, but it does mean you will always try to do that. That is the commitment you have sworn, and you will do it, you see. That's what the psalmist did, and that's what we've done. Now, thirdly, you should obey at all times because obedience, the psalmist says, revives your soul. He says in verse 107, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. This isn't the first time we've seen this idea. Remember, the psalmist was under attack by physical enemies. And when you're under attack, you need help. You need the Lord's help. But to get this help, you need to obey Him. And so the psalmist prays that the Lord would revive him so that basically he would gain God's help through his obedience. Again, the, the connection between the two is that if we want the Lord to fulfill his promises to us, we need to meet the conditions. Now, God actually gives us his Holy Spirit so that we will meet those conditions. But as we saw before, we need to work with the Spirit of God to obey the Lord so that he will give us those things he has promised in this life to help us. I hope that's clear. If it isn't, hopefully it will be in a moment. Now, we all of us have enemies that are continually attacking us. You have enemies that are attacking you. Now, maybe those enemies are not physical. Maybe they are. But they are always spiritual enemies. They're not necessarily attacking your body, but they are attacking your soul. The devil is continually attacking you, laying snares for you in the world to entice your flesh, your sin, to try to get you off the path and to get you to fall. And you know what? He's pretty good at it. So what can you do to protect yourself? What can you do to stay strong? Stay on the path. As long as you're on the path, you are safe. But how can you stay on the path? Well, use the light God has given to you. Obey. See, the path is the path of obedience. You need to stay on the path to be safe. Now, when Satan succeeds in getting you off the path, in getting you to sin, as we said before, you grieve and you quench the Holy Spirit, you grow weaker, and you make it easier for Satan to overcome you. But when you obey, the Spirit works more powerfully in your soul giving you a greater strength to stay on the path so that you can more easily resist the devil's attacks. So do you want greater spiritual strength? Do you want the power to overcome sin? Do you want God to revive you so that you will love Him and others more, so that you'll be basically able to do what God calls you to do more? If you want that, you need more of His Spirit. And obeying Him is a very important way of getting Him. You know, we talk about the means of grace and all the different things the Lord has given to us to strengthen us spiritually. Obedience is one of those things. Because when you don't obey, it quenches the Spirit. But when you obey, it strengthens His work in you. It revives you and gives you a greater strength to resist the enemy. I hope as a believer that that's what you want. The law of God shows you how to do that. Now, you should continually obey because as believers, that is what you have prayed and asked God to, to help you do. Look at verse 108. Oh, accept the freewill offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. Now, if you love the Lord, then you want to honor Him. You want to be able to obey Him. And if that's what you want, you've certainly, I hope, you've prayed that God would help you to do that, right? As the psalmist prayed. 
as Jesus even commands you to pray that you might obey Him. You know, uh, you're familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord says, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what does he mean by that, that your, your, your secret plan would, would come to fulfillment? Well, I think that's included. But I think he's also saying, Lord, grant that all men on earth would submit to your will, even as the angels and the righteous, the spirits of righteous men made perfect do in heaven. Lord, grant that every knee would bow uh, to your sovereignty, to your lordship, to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what Jesus is actually teaching us to pray. And when we pray this... Uh, aren't we also praying that we would obey the Lord as well as others? I mean, we're praying that God would help us to obey. Now, if that's what you're praying for, shouldn't you attempt to do that? Shouldn't you try to obey? Well, that is what is in your heart if you are a believer, and that's what you're praying for, and that's why you should seek continually to do it and not just sometimes. Now, fifthly, the, the psalmist says you should obey the Lord continually because, again, it is the only safe path. He says in verse 109 and to 110, my life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. You notice how the psalmist ties danger and obedience together in his prayer. Because he knows the only way to be safe in a world that is so full of danger is to obey the Lord, as we saw earlier. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want the Lord to take His promise to keep you safe seriously, you need to take His commandment to obey seriously. And I want you to remember this as well, that when you disobey, you're basically stepping off the path of safety and you are purposely stepping into the path of danger. There's a reason why God commands what He commands. It's because He wants you to be safe, and that is the path of safety. Why does God say, for instance, in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods besides Me? Well, what if you do have other gods beside Him? What if you forsake Him and worship some other god? What's going to happen to you? You're going to be destroyed because you're going to miss the only way that God has actually provided salvation, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to reveal the only true God. If you worship other gods, you'll be destroyed. Why does God want you to worship Him and Him alone? Because He's the only true God and the only one who can save you. Uh, why does He tell you in the, the Proverbs, there's plenty of examples in there, but why, why you should not associate with someone who has a quick temper? Because if you do, you will become like him, and you'll get into trouble. Solomon writes in Proverbs 22, verses 24 through 25, Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. Why did God command what he did? So that you would be safe. Why should you steer clear of those who have restless spirits and are constantly changing, especially in their views of, well, in, in this particular case, religion and politics. You know, it's interesting, the two most controversial subjects in the world. It's because you're going to be more apt to get into trouble. They are uh, going to get into trouble. They're going to get you into trouble. Listen to what Solomon says in, in Proverbs 24, verses 21 and 22. My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those who were given to change. For their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that comes from both of them. The point is, God commands what He commands so that we will be safe, and that's true of all His commandments. He tells you to do these things because not to do them will either injure you or others. His path is the only safe path. Now, finally, you should obey God's law because, just think about this for a minute, realizing all these things, how blessed you are to actually possess it. It's yours. 
He says in verse 111, I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Now, let me just review again some of the reasons why it is a blessing for you to have it, because it shows you how to love God and man, because it shows you how to glorify God in everything you do, because it shows you how you can take things out of this world and actually in, enjoy a reward for them, because it shows you how you can walk safely through this world, and because it, it shows you how you can keep yourself spiritually strong and have a revived soul. Now, consider the fact that not everybody has it. Not everybody has the law of God. I mentioned before how many people there are in the world who are destroying themselves, who stumble and fall, and oftentimes without remedy, every single day, because they do not have this direction, or maybe they have it and they don't want to keep it. But God has given it to you. It is your inheritance because you have trusted in Jesus Christ. The Lord, as I already mentioned, gave it to you to be a blessing. I want you to listen to what Moses said to Israel. And again, I recognize this is the Old Covenant, but he's still talking about what God gave to them at that time. We don't keep the ceremonial law anymore. Thankfully, we don't have to bring animal sacrifices. Christ fulfilled all of that through His work. Uh, there are separation laws we don't have to keep, but there's still moral laws, and it is a great blessing to have them. Listen to what Moses says to Israel. This is Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 through 9. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who fail or followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. They worshipped another god. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Now, Moses is saying that you've been singled out from all the nations on earth. God has shown you a great deal of favor in that He is not only your God, but He has given to you these commandments. And so he says, be thankful that you have the true God for your God and that you have His commandments because they are, there is nothing like them on earth. Uh, what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? It is a great blessing to have it. And that's what you have. That's what God has given to you through Jesus Christ. And so you should be thankful. And you should show God your thankfulness by loving this law because, again, it reflects God's holy nature and keeping this law. You should look at them the way the psalmist looked at them, not, not as something dreadful to do away with, oh, you know, cursed is everyone who keeps the law, but they are the joy of my heart. Again, for all the reasons already listed. But again, remember the point this evening, that for these to be a blessing for you, you need not only to keep them by God's grace with His strength. And you can only do that if you have trusted Jesus Christ. 
Okay? He alone can give you the power to do it by His Holy Spirit, but you have to do it continually. Again, the psalmist concludes, verse 112, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Is that what you have purpose to do in your heart, to obey Him and to obey Him continually even to the end? Well, if you want the safety that this law is going to give you, if you want to go through life with your eyes open, if you want to know the truth about what really pleases God, if you want your life really to be blessed here and blessed in the world to come, this is what you need to do. There is no other way. And so may God give to you, may He give to all of us the grace that we need uh, to see this, understand it, to know it's true, and to keep His commandments, to understand His Word, and to do what it is He calls us to do because it is good, because it is right, because it brings uh, blessing. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that. And again, let's especially do that in light of our uh, coming to the Lord's table here in just a few moments.